Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. And tonight we have a very unique platform. And I only say unique because it's unique for me. Um, before Hillary Clinton started running for president, I really did not pay much attention to politics. And I'm gonna be very honest. I might know people, but I don't really know politics. <laughs> so today is not only gonna be educational for me, but also gives me a lot of insight to the ladies that we have on our panel um, tonight that are in politics and who are active in um, making the laws and, and making, the changes that we need in our community um, first and uh, live and up and close, live and close, live and personal, sorry. So tonight we are gonna be talking to several young ladies. We're gonna be talking to Miss Topeka Dave. You can raise your hand when I say your name so everybody sees who you are. We're also hey. gonna be talking to Miss Tara Long, Miss Crumley. There you go. And yeah, please forgive me if I say your name wrong, Ms. Haynes. We have Miss, is it Shamaye Haynes? Shamaye. Shamaye. Yeah. Got it. Got it. I'm proud of myself because I was, I was concerned. Okay. I wasn't going to say it right. <laughs> um, and then we also have Miss Lily Nicole, who will be live with us in a few minutes. So because we have several ladies that we really want to get to know and hear their stories and find out more about them, we're going to just go ahead and jump right in. Um, what I would like is for us to go to each lady to introduce yourselves um, and tell us how you got started working in the community and what business or organization you represent. So we're going to start with Miss Dave. Can you start us off? Yeah, hi. Thank you, Tiffany, for giving me such a wonderful opportunity. Women's representation and leadership in politics and in government is one of my most passionate topics on women empowerment. I am Deepika Dave, the founder at Rising Ambitions of Young Society, that is R-A-Y-S, Race Global Foundation. I studied structural engineering from UNCC, and I have worked as a project architect on many of the projects in hotel industries, and uh, today, and currently, I'm an entrepreneur with retail and small businesses. If I talk about that, um, what made me have founded this Raise Global Foundation? So let me talk about that in brief, that during my entrepreneurship, I have seen many lives struggling from addictions to financial independence to their social existence. So when I started writing about women's issues, um, social, cultural, and financial issues on social media, I started getting phone calls from deprived women. And I thought, I counseled them, guided them. Then I thought that really we need to work uh, and um, the problem is still huge. And we need to bring change about social norms, stereotypes, and fight against bias. and I believe that if we want to bring desirable change in our community, it must begin with ourselves. And so I'm extremely proud to have founded Race Global Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit organization in May 2019 to inspire, engage, educate, and empower young people to build a support network in India and USA. Hundreds of girls have benefited out of our gender equality awareness campaigns in India too. At RAISE, we run women empowerment campaigns, financial literacy workshops with a highly defined purpose for women empowerment. We help young men and girls to have necessary life skill to negotiate help the young men and girls have the and uh, we must we think that we must work towards bringing improvement in health status and needy women of needy women through ensuring easy accessibility and better health delivering system and we strive to eliminate discrimination discrimination and violence against women across religion and ethnicity we provide the consultation by ensuring voices of women across marginalized community, and we will run youth-led campaigns, strengthen their capacity to make gender equality be live reality. 
Due to pandemic, we conduct webinars to educate, engage, and empower youth. But soon we are waiting to start on in person workshops. And we educate boys and men to understand, realize, and accept women's independent identity, their feelings, their work, women's rights, and their leadership. And thus, we do not only make women aware, men too. I believe that we as women of this generation must work towards betterment of next generation of women. And the issues which, for which we are not privileged or we had to fight for, we don't want that same fight for the same issue or topic by our next generation girls. And we know that in the politics, when we talk about politics, there are, this young generation is more progressive and willing to question how the current elections underrepresent women and all over ways the women are systematically silenced. Let that be the motivation for all of you guys, especially the youth, if we take lead and obtain a bigger and more powerful voice in politics, we can demand the changes that will benefit groups that are silenced, such as women and ethnic minorities. It is important to break down patri patriarchal obstacles to human freedom. And I'm very passionate about having seminars, workshops on motivating and encouraging young girls to pursue the field of politics to lead our community and nation. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's Thank you. awesome, awesome introduction. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Uh, Tara, please tell us about you and how you got started as a community leader. Uh, you are muted, Tara. Okay, thank you. So I, I, I wasn't expecting to get into politics. <laughs> in 2017, um, I got told you may have six months to die um, and you need to go get some help. And uh, $7,000 later, the bill ran over to January and $7,000 later deductible that's almost that's fourteen thousand dollars in like just a few months to save my life. Um, I realized um, I'm gonna die in this current system. There is no possible way for me to stay alive with the current healthcare policy. They are going to kill me. And so I was sitting at um, getting an MRI where I had to pay twenty five hundred dollars cash up front. And um, I looked around the room and I'm gonna be honest, there were no mi minority faces, okay? I was told you don't get the procedure if you can't bring potentially $5,000 cash up front. We don't want you here if you can't pay cash up front. Um, and I prayed to God, I said, God, if you let me live, I will spend every day of my life fighting this horrible healthcare policy. Well, it's been three years, I'm still fighting. <laughs> and that's how um, I got. What I learned is that the government actually um, regulates the insurance companies and they allow all of these gargantuan bills. And what I learned is other countries don't struggle like this. This is an American phenomenon. Um, I took it a step further in 2020, I was on the ballot um, for county commission at large. I ran as your healthcare advocate. Um, I did not win. I received probably around 23,000 votes, which I'm proud of. And I'm grateful for everybody who, who voted for me. Um, but my goal was to change public policy um, at, to expand health and human services. If you can't get a Medicare for all type um, insurance, then you can expand health and human services to people that don't have insurance. Um, as far as my community involvement, I sit on the board of Healthcare Justice NC, which is a team of physicians that are tired of not being able to treat their patients because insurance companies get in the way. 
Um, I am very close to Topeka. I spent a lot of time working with Ray's. Um, and of course, I'm very, I sit on proudly on Tiffany's board um, for domestic violence because they're all interconnected. Like what I learned is going out and learning all of these things. Yes, I'm the healthcare expert, but Tiffany's domestic violence victims need healthcare as well. And so we all work strongly together. Um, you know, Shamaye, we're really close friends. Um, she's goes, she, her kids, her kid comes to my kids' birthday parties. And I look forward to, um, to learning more about Lily when Lily becomes available. She sounds really important from what I've heard so, so far. So I'm gonna pass the torch back to you, Tiffany. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hare. Um, I definitely appreciate you. Have you ever watched the show, Good Girls? The girls? Good girls. Good girls. No, I've never seen that. You should watch it. You remind me of the character Ruby. So the basically a very short synopsis of the show. So they're all mothers. So it's three mothers. They're they're characters in the in the TV series. And all of them um, decide that they they are not making enough money or income for their family. And so they start doing criminal activity to wow support their family. So Ruby, her daughter, I believe has, I want to say kidney failure or something, something met is medically going on with her, her young daughter. And so she joins the other two girls who are best friends because she can't afford to pay for her daughter's medication. Um, so it's a hilarious TV series. Um, mom is very strong about, you know, I, I, she's yelling on the phone constantly about why do I have to pay $2,500 for medication when it should be free because I pay for health insurance? Um, and I know you have a sense of humor. So definitely check it out because um, I think that you'll find Ruby to be an, an awesome character. <laughs> um, we are going to move on to Miss Shamaye. I love your name. I love your name. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Tell us about you, Miss Shamaye. Well, thank you for the compliment on my name. I've spent endless hours and time telling people how to pronounce it. <laughs> Definitely it's the whole thing, trying to show people how to spell it. Um, but it is an, a West African original name from a tribe in Nigeria. Um, so it is, it's not just a made up name. It actually has a meaning. Um, it means quiet. I know that's funny. <laughs> but thank you so much, Tiffany, for having me as a guest um, on this podcast. Um, I love coming to speak to the community about a variety of topics and issues. I'm not always as comfortable about speaking about politics, although I am pretty engaged in politics. Um, from my perspective, um, I have been in some form of politics or community organizing since I was a young girl. Um, thanks to my mom, Claudia Fatima Smith. She raised me to believe that as a, as a woman and as a black woman that I could do absolutely anything that I wanted to do. Um, it's sort of interesting. I was raised in poverty yet at the same time, I was still given that sense of what it means to have the privilege of advocating for African-Americans in our community. Um, and so, you know, my, in, in fact, my whole family is in some sort of activism or something. So I kind of grew up in it. Um, my message for tonight, and you'll hear me talk about it quite frequently, is that number one, it is time for black women to start shining in, in politics, we play a key role generally behind the scenes. And when we step out to even run for something, we, we sometimes get uh, demeaned, defamed, talked about, and it's sort of this thing of who are you to be thinking that you can run in a democracy? Um, and so that's point number one. Point number two that I really want to, um, to express is that African Americans in the United States have long been, ever since we've had the opportunity to vote, we've always looked at voting as being the primary source of getting involved in an election. But there are a lot of things that happen and take place before that. Um, before a candidate says, I want to run, there are things that he or she should know. Um, but the main thing is, 
is that one of the things that has held us back um, as, you know, as the African American constituency is that for the longest time, I was very proud to be an independent. And, um, and actually, I mean, I love saying that I'm independent but I've cheated myself as well. Here's why. Because as an independent, you don't have a say in anything the two party system is involved in or what they do. Therefore, when we elect our leaders and when we're establishing party platforms and issues and things, we don't have a say in that. A good example is how in this past election, people were really upset um, that we didn't put forth someone who was much more progressive, um, someone who was really hard on student loan uh, debt elimination, reparation, women's rights, and all of those things. The reason why we, get, we got what we got was because enough of us folks, progressives, African-Americans, and others did not get into the process to establish the platform and push the party to the point where they felt the pressure of needing to do those things. And so what I really wanna stress is we gotta do more than just vote folks. We gotta get in here. We've got to start leading in the two party system. And I don't care what your party is, draw a line in the sand, quit, quit saying I'm an independent because you're giving up, you're giving up your voice and your strength in the two party system when you do that. That'll be my message for the next year going forward. I'm Shamaya Haynes, project leader for the West Side Education Think Tank, and I'm thankful to be on this program today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I definitely appreciate all that you shared with us. And we're going to talk a little bit more about being um, a minority in public politics, especially as a woman. We were, we're going to talk more about that later. Um, Miss Lily, are you ready to tell us about you yourself? Yeah, sorry. Okay, can everyone hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, perfect. I literally just ran to my house. So again, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Um, I am Lily Nicole, a local Wilmington actor, model, uh, recent activist. I got, um, I will actually quote one of the other ladies. I never saw myself in politics. I never considered it, didn't think it was my avenue. I mean, I am a theater and English girl. Like I act, I create sets. I literally, for my living, allowed people to ignore the politics and the reality of the world. And I used art as a way of addressing healing and bringing people together and having community bonds and just outreach in general. That was that was my niche. Over the past few years living here in Wilmington, um, I graduated from UNCW with a theater and English degree and I moved right downtown. I wanted to be in the heart of everything. And I guess my first interaction with any level of community involvement was uh, after Hurricane Florence came and the north side was completely wrecked as was most of Wilmington but the north side wasn't getting any response for as far as assistance they weren't getting food they weren't getting water sent and myself and several community members and actually restaurant owner Fox's Boxes literally spent weeks upon weeks just going through our dry storage goods. We had red wagons, we had water cups, we had coffee cups, just walking up and down the sidewalks just to find out what neighbors were okay, what neighbors weren't okay, and what people needed. And we did that for about a month before we actually had um, a full, fully functioning Red Cross set up on the north side. Not in Wilmington in general, like the south side was full in other areas, but the north side per se. So that was my very first involvement with my community and just diving in and realizing the stark differences from what the north side receives versus the other areas of town. Um, so I then fast forward to this past summer in response to the George Floyd um, assault on live TV, my fellow community members and neighbors, literal people who I live with and live down the street with, we went downtown um, on May 31st and from there, it was over a hundred days of sustained protesting that myself and other organizers came together and literally held the grounds of city hall. And that I could say thrust me into the face of politics or shown myself what level of community involvement I was willing to take upon. And if, if nothing else, I definitely, definitely um, started my activism career uh, from the summer. I lost a lot of things that I would have identified as me or I would have thought identified, you know, me as a woman here in Wilmington. But because of that and because of my new acceptance with my charge, I've actually, I've actually learned who I am as a black woman here in Wilmington 
what I've undergone and what I've taken upon myself and the, the path that I'm creating and or going through. And I love it. I wouldn't take it back. I definitely did not think that this would be my life, but because of everything, I have had the privilege to now be working with the CDC on a document and fellow organizers here in Wilmington called Cape Fear's Comprehensive Violence Prevention Strategy. And it is a plan, a solution, not the end all be all, but it is a plan and a solution to not only combat systemic violence and structural racism that is embedded in our system, but it also is going to give us sound and like foolproof ways to address generational healing, getting inside of the community, identifying the problems, using the language of public health to ask the deeper questions, the root causes of what's going on in our society and not just blaming it on the system and not just allowing our people and our family members and our friends to become another person lost in the system. And I appreciate it when the lady said about addressing the youth because the youth literally are our future. And we have several plans and actually one program that we're launching right now that identifies and focuses solely on the youth and not only finding them and giving them life lessons and actual workplace development, um, internship opportunities where they can actually be paid for the time that they spent and the lessons that they're learning, but it elevates them to be able to advocate for themselves and be able to advocate for their community and get inside and demand better of the system. My entire platform is accountability and transparency through community education and outreach. Um, I'm a founder of a nonprofit, The Lowercase Leaders, which does a lot of community outreach work here in Wilmington. And I am the program coordinator over at Sakota House, which is located on the South side. It is a conscious collective community hub where several nonprofit organizations and community individuals gather together to not only literally brainstorm ways to save our system and save our community inside of a corrupt system, but it is a healing place. It is a welcome healing place. We are the first farm that is recognized in downtown Wilmington. We actually have an actual plot of land with a greenhouse and planter boxes and pallets and we're an, a certified farm and it's open food for the community. So these are just different ways that we're showing by example, how we can live inside of a system that we're trying to fix. And I'm, I'm blessed to be on this platform with all these other wonderful ladies that I would hope to learn from and get to know more. And Tiffany, as always, thank you for inviting me. Of course, Miss Lily. I know that um, your first podcast you were on with us because now you've been on this is the third time, I believe. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I know the first time that we had kind of an emotional moment between the two of us where we were talking about race and recognizing oh, yeah. ourselves as black wom black women in the community. And I've just been watching you just blossom. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm so proud of you. I don't think I can say that enough. Um, <laughs> just very briefly, I met Ms. Nicole when we were on vacation in Wilmington um, and it was right after the George Floyd um, murder. And um, we saw these very, uh, very organized and very nonviolent um, uh, stand-in in front of the, I forgot, what was the name of the building that you were at? We were standing in front of City Hall, which was, um, historically, it was built by slaves. It was literally the um, location where a lot of things happened in our past, but also it was right there on the corner of the street where we as protesters before we met Ms. Tiffany ended up getting tear gas and concussion grenade and assaulted by the cops. Right, right. Um, so they were on City Hall. And so Cedric said, let's stop and get involved. And I was like, no. <laughs> I'm not trying to get involved. I, I do not, because anything can pop off and we're mm -hmm. on vacation. And, but I saw that it was important to him because he had gone to another um, nonviolent protest um, maybe two weeks before that. And it went very well, but I wouldn't go with him then either. So um, we decided to stop and everything was great. There was all different nationalities there. Um, you could tell that everybody was passionate. Um, they had food, water, you had people mm -hmm. coming and dropping off donations. Um, it was very, very family oriented um, and very welcoming and warming. So if it was not for that, I definitely would have told him, I'm out of here. You can stay here. I'm going to the hotel. But it was the total opposite. Um, so it was a perfect example of how um, a demonstration can go, how a protest can go, how a stand-in can go um, without getting violent and without people getting hurt. Um, so I definitely appreciated that. And from there, that's where Lily and I began our friendship. 
<laughs> so thank you again for being on Miss Lily. Um, I love you and I appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right, ladies, we're gonna get we're gonna get into some some serious topics here. The first question I'm gonna ask, and the reason why we put I decided to do this is because we have our first minority vice president. How do you ladies feel about that? Did that do anything for you? Does it does it inspire you at all? Um, what are your feelings on that? Anyone can speak. <laughs> well, I'll go ahead. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Mr. Maya. <laughs> well, for me, um, it's very, so it's very interesting. Um, you know, Kamala Harris came with, you know, um, came with some, some question marks for me, not because she's an African-American woman, but because let's face it, I mean, she's an ex-prosecutor and um, that the prosecutor and the police work together to lock folks up. And, you know, if there's one thing that we can, that we can point to in our community that has had a large impact on us economically and also the preservation of our families and all of these things um, is the criminal justice system and the lack of justice there. And, um, you know, I just wasn't, when, she, when the, when the nomination first came, I really just wasn't ready after after George Floyd and after um, my husband's uh, my husband's friend that dated back from Head Start, Sam Dubos of Cincinnati, Ohio, being shot in the face because of a license plate and the officer attempting to lie about it. He left behind nine children because of that. Um, no amount of lawsuit and settlement will bring him back. And so I just wasn't ready to just say, yeah, I'm just gonna give the green light on this person that has locked black men up. You know, that was that was my own personal hang up. Yet at the same time, I recognized that none of the candidates were gonna be perfect. That not anybody who we selected weren't necessarily going to um, going to look look to black needs and and state, hey, we're going to this is gonna be our African American um, platform or position. No other president has ever done it. This is not, this wouldn't be anything unusual to that. What I will say is that, you know, since Kamala Harris has become um, our vice president, I'll go ahead, sister. You know, I'm, I'm happy for her. She's, she's a black woman. And the one thing that I've had to really stop doing for myself is to stop picking apart other black women. Um, because at the end of the day, that is still somebody who at some point in time in her life has walked the same existence that I've walked. And that's going to be my best bet for getting anybody in here who's going to do something to, real, to, um, to help um, Black people in America gain their full freedom and bring that to full fruition. If I can't count on her to do it, then who can I count on? At the same time, I don't you know, there was this whole thing about, hey, she's made it and we need to support her, blah, blah. No, I gave you my vote. Millions of Americans gave you their vote. And as Black people, we have to hold everybody accountable to our needs and our issues and the things that we desire. As well as, I will take this a step further. Sometimes I speak for Black people and what our needs are. But at the end of the day, if you make it better for black people, you'll make it better for other people in America as well. And, you know, we don't, we're, we're the land of opportunity. And it, we're, we, yet we operate in the spirit of, if I give black people reparations, it's gonna take something from me and mine. We have, a, we have enough to, to make up the rights for the wrongs and we have enough to do all of the things for all of the people in America that should be done. Um, and so I'm going to wrap it up by saying this. I'm very proud of Kamala Harris for the achievements that she's that she's made. No other African American woman. Um, I'm say I'm saying the word after the term African American, knowing that she does have um, 
more of an international background, but for this conversation, just expect, just accept the fact that I'm calling her an African-American woman. <laughs> um, I want to say that because I was getting in some trouble there for a minute. Um, but in reality, she, her destiny is the same as mine because we're both Black women in America. Very nice, very nice. Miss Lily Nicole. Um, my, my statement, I guess you could say, is uh, very similar along the lines of Ms. Shemaya's, which I absolutely love your name as well. Uh, mm -hmm. My first and foremost thing, uh, I appreciate having a woman of color in the White House above all in everything. A woman of color definitely deserves a place. A woman deserves a place wherever decisions are being made, especially a woman of color deserves to be there. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading over the last few months, as most people have or should be doing. I mean, obviously, Angela Davis is in deep, deep circulation. And so it's just reminding and remembering the struggle for the initial like women's suffrage movement versus, you know, black liberation and how like that battle was won and fought and weaved and hoed. And it goes back to, to that same statement. People feel as though if they give black people all the rights and all the power that they need, that they're going to be losing rights and power from the Anglo-Saxon community. And I agree that that mentality has got to stop it. Like more rights or equal rights, excuse me, for one group doesn't take away rights for another group. It's not a piece of pie, you know, like you can elevate another person without tearing yourself down or without losing from yourself. Um, but I too was really, really hesitant when she um, was first nominated or, and also when she, I guess you could say first got her position because we did elect her as this is her job. So this is her job for the next four years she does have a problematic past as everyone has a problematic past. Hers is a little touchy because of her entanglement with the prison system and how prison is a direct extension of slavery, especially for African-American men in our community. And just a lot of people referred to her as a police apologist early on. So even language like that, um, a prosecutor who worked the cause and literally consciously or unconsciously work to break up the black family and minority families and just get them hemmed and hawed over the dumbest things. That, that hurt, that was definitely something that it wasn't easy to swallow. But in that same hand, like my dad's a cop. So you get where people come from. You have to take a step back and look at the whole picture. So at the end of the day, accountability and transparency is what you have to demand. Because whether you like it or not, the team that we have is the lesser of two evils by all, by all means. Like we have people who had a good platform, had a good, a good enough, what is it? A good enough election speech that at some point in time, the majority believed them or had faith in them. So now that they're there, the real job happens for the American citizens. Now you demand accountability. Now you hold them up to what they said. No one's perfect. I'm not perfect. No one walking this earth ever will be perfect. So pushing that aside and just looking at what they said they were going to do and what they're working towards doing is all that we can do. Because at the end of the day, this is their job. What their job was before, it doesn't matter. I've had 700 different jobs. None of them are what I'm doing now. So when I'm interacting with individuals, I want them to hold me accountable of what I'm saying and doing now, not what I said and did three or four years ago. Yes, be wary of that and don't forget it but give them a chance to prove you wrong. And that's how I'm you know, trying to operate moving forward, especially with our current presidency. You want to give them a chance. You wanna hold them accountable, follow up, see what's going on, but also pay attention to like your local, your local environments, what's happening there and what are they saying and how are they supporting and reenacting with Ms. Kamala? You know, what exactly is she really doing? But I'm happy to see a lady who looks like me, man. Let all the mixed people rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. I really like what um, Ms. Shamaye said earlier about her mom instilling in her that as a Black girl, she can do anything that she wants to do. She can be whoever she wants to be. Um, and I think that Ms. Harris being the vice president definitely shows that minority girls, Black, um, you know, Spanish, Puerto Rican, any, any minority woman can can reach the heights that she desires to reach. Um, so I definitely love that um, Ms. Shamaya shared that with us from her mom. Um, and it's definitely uh, something that our, our girls can look up to. And I hope and pray that Ms. Harris will do very well in her, um, her current position. Um, I think that's really important. I know that a lot of people are gonna be watching that, um, especially African-Americans. Yes, Ms. Lilly. 
I think one of the most impactful memes that I've seen like recently, especially since her election, is where they're staggering, you know, um, Ruby Bridges compared with Kamala taking it back to Rosa Parks and says she sat so she could walk so she could run. And if that's not saying it, it just how far like women of color have gotten, like it's just beautiful pro progressions to where we're at. Right, right. Um, Ms. Tara, Ms. Topeka, would you like to chime in? Sure, I'll go. Yes, Kamala won. Trump is out of all. <laughs> and she kicked his butt. <laughs> so, oh, yes. yes, we worked tirelessly. Um, when she, when we're talking about women in politics, um, you know, we're not talking about holding an elected office. We're talking about the grassroots work that it took to get Kamala there. So for me, one of the things that um, I was involved with was campaign writing. Um, so we wrote letters and I organized, um, and I can't give you, a, a, I, I was part of a team that organized over 5,000 postcards. And that's a small number. Lots of people were doing it um, to get people out to vote, voting for your life, okay? And specifically, we were only writing uh, minority voters because we we needed your voice um, and and so for Kamala to win like I found peace look her politics I'm a Bernie like politic wise you know my pol my policy aligns with Bernie but we're there and we worked countless hours to get her elected and we're thrilled that she holds the power um, and I hope that, um, you know, the, my personal opinion is, I hope that she uses this opportunity and the next election, she'll be primed to run for president. Very, very good goal. Very good goal. I've heard other people say that too, like that this opens the door for a, a minority female president or female president. AOC. <laughs> Ms. Topeka. You're on mute. I would say that having a vice president, woman vice president, has set a historic mi milestone with first woman vice president Kamala Harris has caused not just put really big cracks in the glass ceiling in this election, but she is poised to break the glass ceiling in future elections. And since Hillary Clinton ran for the highest position in the government, um, we live in changing and challenging time. Now stereotypes are being challenged and more diverse representation of women is clearly seen. Um, many cultures there are women now have proved themselves and we have successful politicians, accountants, PhDs, doctors, even stay at home. Everyone has some accomplishments in many forms and uh, women have demonstrated their political leadership even in most politically competitive environment of like parliament, uh, Politic parliamentary women's caucuses. And now we can have them work on the issues of elimination of gender biased violence, parental leave and childcare pensions, gender equality laws, and electoral forms. So women leaders have, and women's organizations have demonstrated their skills knowledge networks to lead nations. But my heart breaks when I read an article from Forbes uh, on, the, on a research saying that 50% of men in US and almost 39% of women in US are not comfortable to have a president of the United States. So there are, we can say that uh, double standards still exist on how our societies perceive value, 
and judge men and women so representation matters yes we are so happy to have vice president who is a minority from minority and immigrant parents and she is a we can say she has set a role effect on our next generation and so still as i said the representation matters and when there are many areas that we have more needs to be done than is being done Yes, yes, I t- definitely agree with you. I definitely agree with you on that. Um, that leads me into my next question. Um, when it comes to being a woman in the community, a woman in, in politics, what have been some of your major obstacles that you've experienced personally? So this is a personal question. Ms. Shamaye, I saw you nodding your head. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, well, you know, there are a few obstacles that you face. One, um, and I mean, it varies depending on, you know, what aspect we're speaking of. First of all, I think it's important for us to really define the different places where you can choose to operate. Some people think, you know, politics is this, is, is if you go into politics and you get a seat, you've arrived. But in reality, politics is one particular space that you choose to occupy. So in other words, that you have advocates and you have activists, people who kind of bring a voice to issues, needs, concerns, and desires. They're the ones who you'll see um, doing marches and um, educating the community around various issues. Then you have organizers and community organizers are people who are behind the scenes. They're not, they may not be the ones up front marching, but they may be the ones um, behind the scenes working coalition building and doing those things. When the when we have when we operate at our best politically, it is when all of those groups are strong together. And the reason why is because you have to have people who keep these politicians accountable, right? So the, the area of concern that I have and where I feel, I'm not gonna say that I have personally, but I'm gonna say where, where we stand in, in Charlotte in particular, is that we need to strengthen what we have on the ground. Strengthen our activists and organizers and get them to, to build more coalitions together. Once you're able to do that, and you can stop some of the the turf wars and the infighting and all of that, then we can we can move the needle politically. But have you ever heard the saying, the cat will play, the mice will play while the cat's away? Well, we down here feuding with each other and and, and being disorganized and being single issue minded mm-hmm. and not building coalitions, then our politicians are gonna make decisions without us. Yeah. They're going to move to not keep us informed. They're going to make us, there is no, right now there is no incentive for the activists and organizers in this community to obtain a seat. There are politicians who actively work towards not having that voice at the table. So what that looks like is if we ever want that voice at the table, then you start out as an activist or an organizer, you build a level of constituency and coalitions so that when it's time to vote, we're not confused about who you are and what you're doing. And we haven't been fighting and arguing, we've been unifying around what our platform is so that we can force that politician to give us the things that we need, deserve and desire. So I would say the biggest obstacle is not really having a functioning group, enough functioning coalitions, enough functioning um, broad-based civil rights organizations that when it's time to come together, we come together. If you think about it, African-Americans had the most success in this country when we were willing to move past our egos and go and work with somebody who we did, who didn't, who didn't hit all of our bases. Um, I think that that's an important factor in all of this and not being um, in unity and building coalitions is what is what is hurting us right now. 
So that's another challenge. Let's build coalitions together and let's start to work together more effectively so we can hold them accountable. I definitely agree with that. I definitely agree with that. Ms. Lilly. Um, echoing the exact same sentiments she was having, uh, lowercase leaders here in Wilmington, North Carolina, actually did travel to Charlotte a couple of times over the summer to offer like support and aid and physical organizational um, instruction. I don't want to say like we were going up there to tell people what to do, but like we were reached out to different groups in Charlotte asking for assistance because they saw what we were doing here in Wilmington. And I can echo that sentiment. One of the biggest problems that I've either personally experienced or I've seen here in Wilmington does align along that is miscommunication, especially for women. Miscommunication, having your message either not completely heard or not followed, followed through to a T, so to speak, where people take loose interpretation of it. That and early on literally getting blocked out of city council. Here in Wilmington, it's a good old boys club. We had about two or three people who were openly racist on the board of either commissioners or the council. So being in the front of the protest or being heavily involved in the protest, sometimes literally getting a seat at the table was hard. Uh, there were times that I was escorted out and literally blocked from coming in and then just signing up and never getting chosen. So their attempt to silence my voice early on was something that I found um, became very problematic. So I built my own table. I made my own speaking. I made my own stage. Uh, my group and my organizers, we literally took the, took the, 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 the harsh snub of the nose and we turned it around and we decided we were gonna own and control our narrative. So that is something that I was hyper aware of very, very early on. I am in a very fortunate position. I have connections with different entities here in the community and we were able to have local independent film crews aside from mass media and news outlets. We had actual local independent film crews on the ground doing guerrilla style, like B marketing, like literally catching our footage. So we did have our narrative. We sat down and we had our own table. We used social media to our advantage. Like we had the city's front porch. And literally at one point in time, we're like, if city council won't talk to us, that's fine. We'll talk to you anyway. And we will still address the exact same concerns that we were going to address if you had come and spoke with us. So I can see how that became a problem, but fast forwarding now and getting to where we're at, having representation and having women in positions making the power there, our local elections are coming up. And thankfully there are a lot of women who were activists prior to this year, who went through the summer, got a little bit of different light shown on them, who are now choosing to take that political avenue and become someone who runs for a policy or who runs for a position, runs for um, one of our seats. And I'm super thankful for that. And I'm definitely encouraging and supporting and getting behind them. Um, my sister, Rebecca Tremell is one of those individuals. She had tossed around the idea of getting involved in local politics. But the, the special dynamic here in Wilmington, I do have to emphasize those items and those identifiers that you, that you just laid out that women, especially women of color need, we've actually built that here in Wilmington. We have thriving coalitions of either multiple nonprofits or multiple community members who are grassroots active. Over at Sakota House, again, like I said, it is a culture collective conscious hub where people are coming together they are actively coming together. The Cape Fear Comprehensive Violence Prevention Strategy is a baby that was birthed of different nonprofit organizations getting tired of literally dying at the hands of the police and getting overlooked because of systemic issues and literally being told our lives don't matter. So we came together to protest in a different way. We still take to the streets and I'm very fortunate to have my hands in a couple of different pots. There is a huge huge bubble of people here in Wilmington who, if we did the rally cry, would meet us at city hall steps and post up and do another hundred days if we need it. But we've also used that time since the summer to educate and articulate the importance of coming together and teaching individuals that there is more to protesting than just gathering at city hall steps, taking your, your actual future in your own hands. And like I said, building the garden so that individuals on the South side can have access to fresh food literally out of their own yard. That is a way to protest, like changing their dependency upon the system. And then again, coming together and writing policies where the city doesn't have to support it and enact it, and that's fine. We're hoping they will. But these are tangible items that we have pulled off without their support since the summer. And we're going to continue pulling them off. And we're now asking for a different level of um, community buy-in. Again, if they're interested in actually making systemic change, we're teaching them you have to change it from inside of the system. There are ways to exist outside 
outside of the system. And like you mentioned, you know, that's people who are going down and marching and doing the physical in your face activism. I'm gonna yell with the picket fence and say, F your comfort all day long, because that's exactly what I believe. But I'm also gonna ask you to come and sit down and learn about ways we can fix this, how we can implement policy change without waiting for the voted elected individuals to step up. Because above all, I refuse to wait on an elected official to do something because they've shown time and time again that they don't care about us, especially here in Wilmington, North Carolina. So my job as a woman who has become involved in politics is to educate my community members on the upside of them, highlight the discrepancies in the policies and the procedures that are getting passed around and not talked about, and then show them articulate how they can advocate for themselves. show up again, reaching with the youth, arm the youth with this knowledge and this verbiage and send them to council because at the end of the day, everybody loves the kid. Everybody loves the kids. So if you can train and articulate and educate your youth to speak the battle cries of your community, then I can go stand on the streets and pick it all day long. I can have my youth go and engage mentally and show the community why it's deeper and more necessary. And I'm very, very fortunate to have found that bubble here in Wilmington because we do have the coalition. We do have the people on the streets. We do have individuals who are making policy change and we're writing up documents. And we also have several nonprofits who are buying into this mentality and wanting to learn more. We are about to set up our very first community health worker, the focus in violence prevention training for the summer. Like, I don't know if anyone knows or if you guys have been following what's going on with community health workers, but Biden, one of the first things he said is he wants to allocate a specific amount of money to encourage, elevate, and assist with community health worker training, which is a beautiful thing because across North Carolina, primarily, but also the United States, the majority of our community health workers are minority women who are working in the medical field. They just happen to be liaisons to their community. What we're doing here in Wilmington, we are going inside of the community and identifying individuals who are already doing this grassroots foot to pavement work and elevating them as community health workers and training them in violence prevention, making them a specialist of the specialists of the lives they live, paying them sustainable wages and giving them resources that they can continue advocating and doing this work so real generational healing can begin. And as we're doing this, we're showing the system, the health department, the hospital, all those powers that be, hey, you guys, this is a way to combat actual structural violence. This is a way to get inside of your communities that you care about, the communities that you are elected to protect. This is a way to go in and help them rather than send them off to the cops, rather than send them off to another reform, rather than send them off to the prison. We, the community, are taking back our autonomy and we are building ourselves up from inside. And I, I'm very, like I said, it's, it's a perfect, perfect storm all of the powers that came together to fall into place because I do feel as though the women here in Wilmington are at a place that if they choose to run, if they choose to, to speak a little louder, we are now at a place where we can support them because we have those things that you said Charlotte's lacking. And the wonderful thing about this program is we want to show the world, especially North Carolina, that this is scalable and reproducible. We don't wanna keep it here in Wilmington. This is again, not our blueprint. This is a blueprint of how to address literally the same shit that is happening all over the primarily the South, but of course the world as a whole. But the people who are here in North Carolina, you, you know how deep racism runs. So we're showing you a way that you can get inside of your communities that have been there for years upon years and help them heal while the system takes its time. Because again, Kamala and Biden have a lot to do and we're here for it, but I am not gonna hold my breath and wait for them to save us. We're going to save us. And if I have to educate and elevate and articulate that to every minority and every female, I'm gonna do it until I have no breath left. Yes. I got a Yes, <laughs> yes ma'am. You got me over here pumped, Lily. <laughs> you see me over here <laughs> writing notes? Like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All right. I was thinking about thinking about our next podcast, Miss Lily, Miss Lily, um, Miss uh, Miss Tara or Miss Topeka. Would you like to chime in? Oh, sorry. What are some of the obstacles, Miss Topeka or Miss uh, Tara, that you've had to overcome, or that you know that women have to overcome when it comes to um, being in politics? Main obstacle here in the United States, I have seen that uh, is about having two-party system. Like Ms. Samaya said, that if, I mean, having two-party system, meaning that we use single member district voting system. And uh, this means that out of two candidates, who are almost always going to be either from Democratic 
or Republican Party. And whoever gets the majority wins the election. So, and research has shown that the countries that use single member district system usually have less women representation in government for many of the reason. Like once I, when I say that still we have double standards in our society that exist. And so what happens that the party would select a traditional route to have a higher chance of winning, meaning women will have less chance to go into politics because parties and people show less confidence in women's leadership. So the thing is that leaders cannot be created overnight. Like Miss Lily said, we need to educate and educate, engage our youth, especially younger girls into politics. And that is why I like to always uh, work, do the workshops on, um, on especially why financial literacy, because I like to empower each girl that only getting education and just getting married and sitting at home is not empowerment. Empowerment is that you be a financial independent. If you are financially independent, then you are an empowered woman. And if you are an empowered woman, then you can fight for others' uh, rights. You can fight for others' issues. You can uh, empower other people. So I like to say that we should educate and engage and empower young girls right from the, they are in teenage, they are in the schools, and we should have developed, we should develop their leadership skills and we should encourage them to pursue the, the it's not difficult fields, but we can say that it is considered as men's dominated field like STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, those field, or the politics. These girls, we need to educate them to pursue these uh, fields and lead our community and lead our nation. Very good. I definitely um, agree with you that we have so much opportunities to advance our community with our youths, starting with our youths and educating them, teaching them, mentoring them, and showing them that they can speak up without using guns, without using fists, without hurting one yes, another. Yes, because especially when our society is um, not, if they don't have enough confidence in women's leadership, even though, like I said, that women have demonstrated their leadership almost in all of the fields everywhere in the world. And still, if society has that stereotype that uh, they don't have uh, enough confidence in the women's leadership, then definitely we need to work aggressively, progressively, and willingly to work on this uh, empowering young girls and encourage them to pursue the, the field of politics so that we can fight for uh, the policy policies uh, we need to have for women and minority community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Tara. Okay, so um... So I'm going to try and bring on a little bit of experience for running for office um, as a woman um, and, and talk a little bit about policies. The first thing I want to say is that, um, you know, Mecklenburg County, it's pretty awesome when it comes to electing females. We have a, a large um, group of very strong women. Uh, specifically the Democratic women, and um, we're very powerful in the community. Um, and so with running, and this may be me be being naive, but there was only one incident that I felt like 
wow, that was probably a little bit inappropriate. Uh, somebody online said that, uh, judged me because I was away from my family running a campaign. Now, if it had been a male and the male was out running a campaign, they don't ever judge you. But because I was out running a campaign, speaking at events, and I was a mother and my child was at home, I got judged by it. That you is know, what it is, double standard. <laughs> it is what it is. So I, I let that a go. A woman's place. Mm -hmm. um, you know how Facebook is, a bunch of women jumped in and started going, how dare you judge her like that? What if the man, you know, you know, you know, so they defended me and, um, and then, um, so one of the things, that, specifically the policies around health um, that are horrible for women is that one of the things is women are responsible for bearing the financial burden of childbirth. So if you spend $20,000 to have your child and you don't pay it, it hits your credit. It doesn't hit the man's credit. The man is scapegoat free. Okay. Um, you know, if you choose, the girl is more than likely going to have to bear the burden of birth control. So we have to go to the doctors and pay the doctors for the birth control. I, you know, I just got sterilized. That's going to be $7,400 plus. They quoted me something like 15000 Um, You know, all the bills aren't in, but you know, my deductible is 74,000 and then I paid 20%. So it's going to be more than that for the sterilization. My deductible never ends. Um, so, so these are things that we need to address. How, where is the man's accountability to this? And what about our pay? We're not getting paid as much as men. We're often not getting as many uh, job opportunities as men. We're expected to stay home and take care of the kids and not get paid. You know, women, if you look at the statistics right now, because of COVID, yeah. women are leaving the, um, the workforce to take care of their families because the, statistically the guys are gonna make for. Why in the world would my husband who makes $90,000 quit his job to stay at home with the kid when I may make 34,000 as a teacher? Okay, it's not economical. The teacher, the lower paid person is going to stay at home. And, and, and so there's so many different policies that we have to address. And then also as a, as a, um, as, well, I'll, 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 I'll end it there. But there's so many different things that we need to address to make women more powerful and more equal through public policy. Yeah. Adding on to what you commented, and you said like a lot of men are staying in the workforce and a lot of women are having to quit their jobs to stay home because they're the lower breadwinner. We'll stack those up. If you were to dive deeper, like you said, there are people who are educators who are choosing to stay home and their husbands may be someone, you know, who works in like the mail slot or something at, at, at some of the jobs. On basis, women definitely need a pay rate increase. Like that, that has been across the board, hands down. Women have been underpaid for the jobs that they do. But if you look at the jobs that they do, they are doing actual life-sustaining work, domestic laboring, you know, dealing with children, educating, nurse, medical deliveries. Those are the jobs that women are like, are, are inhabiting more often than not. Even like if you're dealing with like the office administration, like the front face of the organization and then making the calls and all of that stuff, the, the balancing of the books and the financing, those are the jobs that women do more often than not. And if you take those out, you take those across the board, you take them off, more jobs, more companies, more businesses would literally plummet and fail without the regular day-to-day -day tasks that women do. But like you said, women are not given half as much credit as they, as they deserve for the low-end jobs that they do that literally keep these companies running. So my question is, why do you as an educator, not you per se, but why do you as an educator have to quit your job to stay home and take care of your child while your husband works part-time at some bogus thing, making enough money to sustain you? Why aren't our women paid enough? Why aren't our educators paid enough? Why aren't our caregivers paid enough to actually sustain? And why do women have to step down and take care of the kids? Why is that a natural selection automatically? You have kids, it's like, oh, well, of course you're gonna be the one that stays home and take care of them. What if I don't want to? 
What if I want to have a kid and go back to the workforce? What if I want to take my kid back to the workforce? What if I don't want to leave them home with you either? Like, Mm -hmm. why are our choices made for us just because we're a woman? Yeah. Very very good points. Very good points. Um, I know that I work with um, with parents that are in a childcare program. And I would say probably 90% of the mothers of my, my scholars are home or let go of their jobs or so forth because of COVID and their children being home and not um, having employers who were willing to work with them when it came to their schedules so that they can take care of their kids at home and so forth. And it's, it's really, really sad. But the other thing is, is I've helped women get jobs, get education, get training and go back to work to take care of their kids. And when they said, you know what? I've been a stay at home mom for the last 10 years. I don't have any work experience. And I always immediately say, you have plenty of work experience. You have, uh, you have, management experience, you have accounting experience, you have event planning experience, you have all of this experience that just because you are home with your children and not getting paid does not mean that you do not have work experience, does not mean that you don't have transferable skills to get a job and a good job. Um, So that's definitely something that um, that needs to needs to be um, addressed. Um, the, the way women are treated in the workforce, the, the pay, um, the position, the, the titles and so forth. And you're right, Ms. Lily, if we didn't have the office managers, if we didn't have the nurses, if we didn't have the CNAs, if we didn't have the teachers, why do teachers get paid less than, than uh, the basketball players? <laughs> the basketball players are being taught by all of these teachers and they're not making ha- not even a quarter of the money that these, these basketball players, football players and so forth are made, making. So the, I definitely understand Ms. Ms. Lily. It's a, it's a frustration for not only me, for a lot of women and it's a lot of mothers who right now, especially with the pandemic are really, really putting um, their families first, which they should, but they're, mm-hmm. it's taking a toll on them financially, mentally and emotionally because they're, they, they, have, they feel like they have to make this choice to be mothers. They have to make this choice as a woman in the house. And that, that's not right. And that's not the way it should be. It's because politically the world doesn't value women. They, they want them, they covet them, they uplift them a couple months of the year, but overall they do not value women. They think that they are interchangeable entity that can, like you said, if you get pregnant, you go home, you're fine. You're another cog out of the, the wheel and that's it. There mm-hmm. is no value placed on womanhood. Y'all, right. I gotta say something though. For, I gotta say something for the black women out here now. You listen. <laughs> it's it's women- all about, you can say, only about my society's mindset, about the jobs men do and women do. We need to change right from the root. It's not like if we say that, why is um, people like, like Miss um, Tiffany, you said that uh, ten year after ten years. So I studied. I stayed home ten years. I mean, I used to help my husband in business, but for ten years, I took care of my kids, and then I thought that I just need to do uh, or brush up my skills and knowledge and education. So that in future, if I want to go back to um, workforce in engineering, so I went back to UNCC, got my engineering degree. But the mindset I'm talking about is that so many of, even including women, said that, Deepika, you don't need to do all this. Your husband is earning. You just enjoy your life because I went back to school in my late 30s. So this is the mindset. I would say that it will not be changed until we ourselves step up and show the example in our society. Say that, see, in the late 30s, I can get my engineering degree. I can get a corporate job. Yes, I did. Okay. And so this is all about that is, is only we cannot keep blaming um, the system, but we need to work ourselves on that to change the points of view, the 
people look at <clears throat> women's uh, women's uh, work, women's uh, feelings, women's achievements, and women's um, mindset. Everything we need to work on, and that will be done only if we work at root level. When the young generation, they are very at their mind, we can mold, we can mold their minds to perceive the new world at new point of view. Thank you. I do have a lot of strong um, opinions about this. So, you know, as we're speaking about women's and women's issues and needs, I have to call out though, being a black woman is not the same as just being a, a, a white woman. Um, even a Latin American woman or some other woman. Black women, and this is the piece where people really, 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 really need to be sensitive about when it comes to Black women, okay? In our culture, Black women are the breadwinners. We're making the money in our particular culture. Why? Because we've got men who are incarcerated. When they do come home, they can't find work and they have difficult situations. We've got an education system that is counterproductive when it comes to black men and their needs to be educated. And so what happens is black women are thrust into this situation to where, well, you work and so what else do you want? You know, you're you're the you're the strong, you're the strength of the economy. You're the strength of the black race. You're the strength of and what do we get in return? We get to die like white men do in the same deaths, heart attacks, stress-related um, issues. We get to take care of our parents after they've lived their lives and have taken care of us. We get to have the stresses of our grown children. All of these things compound compounded. And so what I'd like to say is like, I ain't afraid to tell y'all as a black woman, I wanna sit my tail down, <laughs> philanthropy, I want to go and uh, play bridge. I want to, hey, if, if another woman wants to get out here, bust her tail work and go and pray, I don't mind. But the problem is not what women are doing or necessarily the opportunities that we get or don't get. I think the problem is we don't have a choice in what we want to do. If a woman wants to stay at home with her children and she's by herself, there should be something in place to help her do that. If a woman is married and she wants to get out here and work and climb the ladder and whatever, there should be a way for her to do that. If a woman decides, like me, you know, I'm y'all, I'm almost a half a century old. I'm like, I'm tired. I just want to sit down and then just, you know, chill. Not necessarily. Y'all know I ain't gonna never chill. <laughs> but you you get what I'm saying? It it becomes such it becomes such an enormous burden on black women because if if we quit our job what's going to happen to our family structure that's that everything yeah. um we're taking care of everything including society including um catching five buses to get to our cna job or whatever um and and one other thing too is that in the corporate structure. We're more educated than everybody else, yet we're not getting promoted to the jobs that we're actually qualified to do. If we get out here and get an associate's degree, the best we can do is get a job that requires a high school diploma and we go crazy in our minds trying to prove to ourselves that we're just as good as somebody else. And we're not, and in other words, you know, there's a terrible burden being a black woman in this country because people pat us on the back. Oh, I'm gonna vote with black women. Well, you, why you voting with me? You need to promote me, okay? <laughs> why you voting with me? You need to help me educate my children. While you voting with me, you need to walk alongside me. And when those, when, when those decisions are being made, choose a black woman or a white woman. Choose the black woman. Sometimes. I agree. It's system. It's the system. It's definitely not lack of desire. No. And it's and we've done, hey, black women, we know how to play the game. Yes, ma'am. 
educated, we don't care if we rack up a gazillion dollars of student loan debt. Yep. We go out yep. here, we present ourselves, we do what we think we should be doing, and then yet at the same time, you can go Still don't get a major corporation, look in the parking lot. That beat up jalopy is the black woman driving it. That Tesla yep. is somebody else driving it. And I'm yep. just, you know, we, we got to we got to create a space where women just have choices in what they want to do, not to have to go out and work, not to have to do uh, 10 jobs just to make up for what one person got one job doing. It, it, and it's not a matter of education anymore. We're getting nope. educated. We just don't get what opportunities we get education and skills. Okay, um, I'm off my soapbox now. Ms. Lily, Ms. Lily, <laughs> not to cut you off, but I think it's really important for us to ask Topeka too, because of your culture. Um, I know that for in you, in, for your culture, that it's it's the same where women are um, culturally supposed to take care of the home and supposed to take care of your children, and that the men are supposed to be the ones working and, and being the breadwinners, and that women should not be educated, and women should not go to college and women should not go to work. So share that with us, because I feel we have different dynamics on our panel tonight. And I just want to make sure that we share yours, because you have a, a, a dynamic um, when it comes to the women in your culture as well. I would say nowadays, time is changing. It's not like women should not go out now. Everybody's getting education, not only get on education, they're getting higher education and women are doctors, engineers. But the thing is that this, our uh, societal culture is set that women, when they go out and work, when they come home, they also working at home also for all this household work. So the thing is double burden of work. So it's not like nowadays women just staying at home they, yes, they do go out and uh, they are proved uh, leaders. They are proved doctors, engineers, architects, um, professors. They are there. But the thing is that double burden of work, sometimes I'm thinking that lagging them behind on taking the responsibility to say, if, as for example, if I'm working out, when I come back home, I have, I mean, give me the, put me, let me put it this way, that I had a friend, she and her husband, they both work as an engineers. As engineers, they both uh, on the same uh, um, designation, they both were earning same level of, uh, of salary. But when they come back home, that her husband, sit on the couch watching TV and she has to put her purse and right away go into kitchen and cook and help kids in the homework. And so the thing is the double burden of work. So I have seen many educated girls choose to stay home because they think that it would be better to keep up with family. And our culture is family oriented. Mm -hmm. Nobody would like that um, uh, when they have kids and they get uh, divorced, parents get divorced. Mm -hmm. So the thing is the mindset, that is what I insist, I keep saying again and again, people's mindset needs to be changed and we need to be, we need to set examples in our homes right from kitchen, right from the bedroom, right from the from your home. Mm -hmm. And then only we will have like, if I'm working when outside when I come home, if my husband is helping me at home, my boys would perceive the situation that, okay, mom is working, dad also helping her at home and mom is helping husband, um, dad at outside work. Mm -hmm. So this is what the equality will come right from the home. Yeah, very good and point. And then only we can expect, like my daughter, if I have a daughter and if my daughter see that my mom is a superwoman, she is taking care, she can take care of 
outside world. She can take care of home. She can uh, take care of kids. She can, so if she's doing that, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I had a um, domestic violence victim. She was um, of Indian culture. Um, and I remember her saying that she was, um, she was an engineer, but she said when she went home, she was still expected um, to do all of the the, yeah. the the chores, to do the cooking, to do so, yeah. so and so on. So, and that they looked down on her, her family looked down on her because she chose to go to work and so forth and so on. So um, that's what my thing saying is that if women, if women cannot lead their family, then mm -hmm. how they can lead the community and to uh, go into politics and have the higher position in the government. Mm -hmm. For that, first they need to learn to lead family, mm -hmm. have their voice against these stereotypes, have their stand against all this um, uh, manly domination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once they will lead their family, then they'll be able to lead the community and then we can talk about leading the nation. Yes, yes, yes. That's a very powerful statement. Very powerful statement. Um, Miss Lily. Thank you. Um, I was just gonna agree with her. I, I completely agree that you have to change the narrative at home of what's expected and what's allowed. Um, the old the old quote or the old thing is you live what you learn. So yes, if you come home on like, I, I come from a blended family. My parents divorced when I was younger and both of them remarried. So my mom was a single working mother for a while until she married my stepfather. And so she did a lot of it. You know, she worked for herself. She did the athletes and, you know, bust us. Like I was a very, very active student. So, you know, I had a lot of after school stuff and she showed up and she did that. But she also went to work and she cooked. And so, you know, she was my superhero. She was my mom, made yeah. me believe I could literally do whatever the world I set my mind to. And because of her, I didn't see limitations in life and I didn't have any fear in making life changes I, like I went to college for nursing and then like a year into it I was like man f this and I literally dropped my degree changed my school moved three hours away and I started studying theater and English and I knew I had the support of my mom because like you said like I had that ingrained in me I can do whatever I want to do I am superwoman but that same dynamic going to my dad's house my stepmother was a stay-at-home mom until my brother and sister got into high school and then she went back to the workforce and she would wash clothes every single day, cook dinner every day, make breakfast, the lunch, did the whole like shuttling around the car. And then when she did go back into the workforce, she came home, still did the same thing, helped with the homework, did the laundry, did this, that, and the third. And my dad, he went to work, he came home and he sat on the couch, ate a bowl of Fruit Loops. And that was, that was what Steve did. So it's not only um, just solely like locked in your culture unfortunately that 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 stigma and that mindset happens a lot and it happens a lot because family is allowed and that's the dynamic that gets built so I completely agree like you live what you learn and we do still again I will always advocate you have to engage and you have to interfere and you have to intercept the youth and change their mentality let them know yeah you can be a home winner you can like cook the bread but you can also go out and make the bread you know you can do both but for women like I appreciate what you were saying like hammering in that they need to find their voice and they need to be able to stand on their own two feet because women need to be able to have that dialogue especially young women as they're coming up in the dating culture and articulate what they will and will not allow with their partners with their spouses with their boyfriends and people who will become their significant others I as a woman will date you know like you you know they need to be strong in their own self to say to their partner and the people they're building a future with I want to go to work but I'm also you know going to come home and cook or if they're not someone who wants to cook you know tell their partner you're going to have to share the responsibilities and so I do appreciate you hammering in that we do have to teach our youth because that's something our young women have to be secure and articulating. They need to know the level of comfortability that they want to grow with so that they can articulate their boundaries and their demands, not in a negative way, but their demands in a healthy relationship going forward, how they as young, especially minority women want to be treated and or respected in a relationship going forward. So teaching our young ladies that they can have it all they can be the breadwinner and the bread baker if they want to, but also it's not impolite to demand their husband to wash a darn dish. Like that's something that we do need to have our older girls. But in that same fold, we need to teach our boys how to make the bed, do the laundry, walk the dog, take the trash out without being prompted. Because this is not a one trick pony. This is not like a head of the household. This is a mutual partnership. So instilling that belief that women are equal at home will help them transcend the belief that they're equal into the community and will help them go into further scales of politics. But also, like I said, lack of desire 
is not in the minority like population. What's in the minority population is lack of ability and lack of access and, and lack of getting to point B. Women want to achieve it all, but like Ms. Haynes pointed out, we are we more often than not, especially the minority population, because of police apologists and systemic failure, we are set with the cards against us. There are more often than not a woman doing it all because she has no choice and she doesn't have the opportunity to go back and get her engineering degree. There's a lot of women who might not even have more than a bachelor's degree and she's getting treated as if she doesn't even have an associate's degree. So, so still the system is stacked against us because we don't have the same opportunity. No matter what your dialogue and your energy and your, your enthusiasm is and how far you wanna shoot, if you don't have that familial structure back at home and if you don't have that spouse or that partner to balance it, you don't have a standing chance. There is no equity, there is no equality. Like we're not on the same, we're, we're not in the same starting line. We may be in the same race, but we're not in the same starting line. Yeah, right. right. Um, Miss Tiffany, if you have a yeah. couple of minutes, I can talk about one more thing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, there is a data taken from Harvard Law School Forum on corporate governance says that in U.S. there are only 5% women CEO. In yeah. India, it's only 4%. And no more than 10% all over the world so why women cannot make at the top level, top positions? So very at low level, if we think that, just I can give you one example that if a woman is getting to a vice president uh, of a company, that designation, and, and a man getting that same position, so, it will be expected that if man has to travel, oh, the partner, female partner, she is at home, will take care of kids, will take care of home. But at the same time, if that wife has to travel, so she would not take that position because who will take care of kids at home? Who will, uh, and she is not expected to leave everything at home and just travel for just her own achievement, her own career. So this achieve, woman's achievement should be considered as family's achievement, like men's achievement. We consider that if dad is being a corporate level person, so we say that, oh, this is our family's achievement. So why woman's achievement is considered only her achievement, not family's achievement. And that is why women are being held back on getting the biggest, I mean, the highest level of the positions. And that is why this is the data saying that only 10% all over the world, no more than 10% women are CEOs. And, and even that Facebook um, um, chief operating officer, uh, Cheryl, Sandberg, she said that women are not making it to the top of any profession in the world. Right, and that goes back to what Ms. Tara was saying, that she was being chastised for being out, um, running for office and, and doing her community work because she was leaving her children at home. Um, right. Yeah, so when you want you want these top positions and you're going for these top positions and you're chastised because you're a mother and you have kids yes. at home. So, and you are not supposed to perceive your career. It is considered as selfishness mm -hmm. that, uh, oh, you are leaving your children behind and husband and everybody at home behind and right. you going to, to perceive your own. Uh, what you are doing is okay. You don't need to go higher at vice president level and you don't need to travel uh, across the countries and uh, internationally. Right. And they've, there's also been studies that more and more women now are having children later in life because of that reason, Be, or getting married later in life because they want to reach their career goals first before having. But then also, women will be at blame that now at later age, if you have kids, you will have problems. So mm -hmm. why you don't consider having family first? You can do your career later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So right. No matter what women do, they will be blamed on anything to everything. And that is the mindset I keep hammering on that people <laughs> need to change that right from your home. Yeah. Now, my kids will not ever think about that. Oh, that my wife has to stay home. No, my kids will not think about that. Yes. 
I've, I've teached my students as well that um, when it comes to doing household chores, when it comes to doing something out in the yard, we all do it. It doesn't matter if we're a girl or boy, a woman. It's a teamwork. It should be considered as teamwork. Like right. in corporate jobs or any outside world, mm -hmm. we, if all teamwork is work, team members are working well on a project, right? so we can say that project will be successful. It's same right. way. Family is a project. Right. And we all are team members. We all have to contribute equally to be a successful family. Yes, yes. And it starts at the root. It starts with your mindset. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Um, and you're and even though I know you keep repeating it and saying that you're hammering it, but you're you're doing that because it's true. We do need to start with our, our youths. We do need to start with our families. We do need to start in the home. And yeah. that's for a lot of different issues in the community. When it comes to domestic violence, when it comes to, you know, uh, racial inequality, we have to teach our children. Domestic um, violence case, why it reached up to that level when the guy start abusing you verbally, mm -hmm. you have to take your stand. Right. Then the guy start first time slap you. That's the point you have to move on, that I'm not going to be in this relationship where there is no respect. There's no, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that is why I had a, I just um, a post on Valentine's Day on social media saying that your Valentine's Day is valent for each couple. It's a Valentine's Day every day if mm -hmm. they respect each other more. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. all. That's all you need. Respect. Yeah. Very much so. Very much so. <laughs> on, on the domestic violence tip, like as we're hammering it in, I just I, I take that like super. It is definitely a drum that I will beat and I will beat that forever. A lot of the verbiage, especially like you said, hammering it and making sure that we're controlling the narrative at home. Domestic violence isn't only like the first time he says some reckless stuff, the first time he puts his hand on. Women are like guilty of domestic violence as well. Mental manipulation, yes. verbal abuse, physical assault. Yes. And LGBT communities literally suffer from domestic violence and they don't get acknowledged because they're not a domestic partnership. So right. so I, again, I will completely hammer that, that narrative that we need to talk about it at home, but I'm going to hammer the narrative we need to talk about it with genderless roles. Doesn't matter who your partner is. Like, yes. Like it's it's not a, a male assaulting a female all the time for domestic violence. There are so many cases of domestic violence that get thrown out the door or skirted under for LGBT communities, minority people, and women who are the abusers and the assaulters. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Um, more and more, we are seeing nowadays that women are um, are becoming the abusers. And I'm not. Um, let me take the back. Not becoming are being recognized as the abusers because when women are the abuse the abuser or the abusive one they always look at the man as being weak because the female is the abuser and working with domestic violence um, victims and um, uh, working with domestic violence families the even women if they're they're hitting the man or so forth and so on they try to get him in counseling or they get uh, lesser charges against them or something like that um, because they they see women as weaker vessels but Sometimes a woman can do damage, can be just as hurtful and just as abusive as men can. But because they see women as weaker vessels, they they don't get treated the same way unless they kill the person. That's totally different. But just hitting them, scratching them, um, you know, abusing them mentally, emotionally, so forth and so on. They see women as weaker vessels, and so that's why a lot of men that are victims they don't report it because they know they're not going to be taken seriously or they're gonna be seen as weak, or they're gonna see as being feminine or something like that. But when you look at the LGBT community, they already have their own set of issues as being LGBT couple. Then you add domestic violence to it. And because they're LGBT, they're already, they're already not getting the services that they deserve when it comes to um, the criminal services, the court services, the, the hospital services even even the fairness when it comes to being married or not being married, domestic partner or not being domestic partner. Now you add domestic violence in there. And honestly, they don't care. They don't, they don't, they don't care. They don't care. They don't see it the same. They see two women fighting. They don't see that as, a, as domestic violence. They might see it as assault, but they might not. They, they're, a lot of times they don't see it as domestic violence because it's two women or it's two men. So that's a really, really good point. That's a really good point, Miss Lily. Um, we have about 18 more minutes. And earlier I said, you know what? We might not get to nine o'clock, but we're gonna get to nine o'clock. 
because we got a lot that we're talking about. <laughs> um, so we got about 18 minutes. So I want to make sure that I ask this question. How do each one of you empower other women to be active in their community? Personal question. So I will say um, that more on an unofficial basis than anything, um, I'm always here open and available to help anyone who, who asks. Um, there are, I'm not an inherently rich woman myself, but I do have a certain level of social capital in this community. Um, I've helped people find jobs. I've helped people do resumes. I've helped people, I've helped people on my job do various things. And so for me, it's about um, not necessarily working from the perspective of officially always trying to do something for somebody. But if somebody asks you, hey, sis, I like your garden. It's beautiful. Hey, I'm going to show you. You want to know how to do that? I'll show you how to do that. Um, I like your hair. What do you put in it? You know, hey, I, I don't really put anything in it other than a little <laughs> oil and some water and, you know, this. But whatever it is, being willing to help your sister. Um, sometimes the things that we take for granted um, are big to another woman or to another person, period. Um, sometimes um, I've become a person because of my best good girlfriend. Um, her name is Trevina. She lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. Hey, Trevina, if you're watching. Um, one of the things that she taught me in friendship was don't let people ask you. If you see somebody needs some help, just help them. And that's a powerful thing because I'm a person who if I ask you for something, it's because there is a high level of trust between us. I don't go around asking people for stuff, asking for this, asking for that. If I ever ask you to borrow some money, we are friends. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But when you have people around you who, who say, you know what? Her stockings are a little worn. Might need a, a new pair. Well, we don't wear stockings anymore, but you know what I mean? Her shoes are run over. Well, you know, help a sister out. See if you wear the same size. Offer it to her. If she don't take it, you know, but chances are most normal people are not going to turn down something that you have to offer them. Um, I'll tell you a good example. Now, this is not a young woman, but I'm really proud of it, so I'm going to brag anyway. <laughs> so I love gardening. I'm not by any means a master gardener or anything but i've had a garden for probably about five years that's 10 gardening seasons including winter well seven because i don't always do gardening in the winter. but um there's a young man up the street and he convinced his grandmother to get himself a garden plot and um and she said i'm not getting him no garden plot i don't know nothing about no gardening i said you leave him to me we will do some gardening and when I tell you that I was stealing cucumbers heavily out of his garden this year because he, he surpassed what I ever thought he could do, you know, in one in one good season. And so I say that to say that we don't have to officially do mentoring in our communities. We got to get back to the old school of, you know, I remember when I was growing up and, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money and stuff like that. And somebody gifted me with like a little lady stuff because they recognized, you know, my stuff was kind of raggedy a little bit. And just anonymously in a gift box to me, so it was special to me, um, they gave me that. Not because I asked for it, not because I was less than anybody else, but somebody in my community said, you know what, I got a few dollars. Let me go over here and take care of this little sister over here. Advice is the same. It, it's what God gives you. Give it out free. That's not, you know, um, many times we take, and, and that's something true for African Americans. Because people have devalued our time so much through slavery and working for free, people will often devalue our time, our energy, our efforts. They mean something. And that equates in the community when you give that back to somebody else. You're multiplying, you're replicating your good, you're replicating your strength, your abilities. 
And so I tell people, hey, if you ain't got money, you got chances are you got time. If you don't have time or money, that's problematic. You probably need to look into something. But give your God given talents. I definitely do on a regular basis. I put a lot of time, effort, and energy into my nonprofit work, but I also sow into the people who are involved um, any way I can. And I don't give specific stories because I don't, except for little Jordan. Now, I'm proud of him. You know, that's <laughs> it. I got bragging rights on that. But in terms of what I do for people, y'all would be amazed at some of the people who I've encountered and I've done things for without asking for anything in return other than their own personal success and excellence. Mm, very much. Um, I think that, that that's definitely interesting that I've seen um, among minorities and especially among minority women or black women that so you're going against each other you're not unifying you have all you have these skills that if you come together you can do something amazing together but there's so much competition so much drama that happens um i told someone the other day i said i work with a bunch of women and i hate to say it but i work with a bunch of black women and it's always drama unfortunately that has been my experience unfortunately but I do know that things have, that things have changed. The older I get, the better my circle, the, the, the better I am at choosing who I let into my circle and who mm -hmm. I surround myself with. I try to surround myself with positive people, positive people yeah. who want to do for the community, who want to give, um, who are not trying to hold anybody back. And I think it's just really important as women that we have so many things against us. We cannot hold each other back. We have to support each other no, we don't have to support each other. We should support each other. And mm -hmm. and that's something that um, was, was lacking before, but I see more unity now. I see more, more women willing to help each other now because we're recognizing that we have to be able to support one another, no matter what color we are, but especially mm -hmm. black women. I'm seeing more of an uprising of, you know, of, of, of queenship, of sisterhood, yes. of friendship, of coming together because uh, they have the the, our, the black sun movement. I have a black son um, of having our, our men murdered and in the community, whether it's by a police officer or by another black man. Women are starting to recognize that there is in numbers, that there is progress in numbers. Um, and so I really, really appreciate when someone does for another and they don't expect anything in return, but it's because they have the ability to, to, to uplift and help another another um, woman, especially minority women. So I really, really appreciate that, Ms. Jemaine. Ms. Um, Lily, tell us, how do you- I think, I think um, a really good way, I I mean, definitely like Ms. Ms. Haynes was saying, you know, just A, being present and being available. And if you are able to help, definitely use your time, your resources, or even just your connections. Like I said, uh, one big thing that became one of my grounding platforms over the summer is outreach, community education and outreach. So connecting community members where you may not be able to help them, but you know that there's a resource or something. But even digging deeper, if you don't have the time or the money, like, and, and that's fine. Again, not everyone does, especially minority communities. You might not have the time, you might not have the money, but at the end of the day, you always have the opportunity to advocate and uplift. And I know, Miss Tiffany, that you said, you know, we, we should uplift and empower other women, but I'm going to go back to your original terminology. We must we have to, in order for women, especially minority women to survive in the world today, we have to uplift each other. We must encourage the next person, even if it's something as simple as advocating in your realm. Like Ms. Dahab was saying, like in the STEM world, there's not a lot of women who are either interested or comfortable enough to articulate their interests. So if you get your foot in the door, you've got to be that advocating point. You can't yeah. be the person who closes the door behind you. Like yeah. if you don't have the time or the resource, that's cool. But once you're there, dude, leave the door cracked, open up the window, like the take the screen down. Do yeah, you like <laughs> exactly. You've got to not only use what you do have. And again, if you don't have time or money, that's cool. But you've got the advocacy. You've got your God-given voice. You have the ability to still articulate the necessity of female minority representation wherever you are. And I think at the end of the day, that should be the most simple thing that all women, especially minority women, do. And they must uplift. They must advocate. They must encourage their fellow sisters. Because without 
some sense of encouragement or without someone telling you how they did it once upon a time ago, there are a whole slew of young women who are never going to do it. And I think that that rings home. Like over the summer, I was um, the founder of Wilmington School of the Arts. So I was the madam chair of a nonprofit charter school focusing on arts integration with a specific focus on minority females and men coming from impoverished or literally ethnic minority, physical minority, um, single parent household. They, we wanted to make sure we focused on the other demographic. And over the summer with everything that was going on, I was asked to step down because of political reasons. And yet every single day there were young ladies that came up to me and there were moms that came up to me. I got pulled to the side countless times over the summer. And I was told I'm enrolling my daughter into the school because there's someone that looks like her doing things that we stand beside. And I didn't do this for the kids that were in my school. That was absolutely the last thing on my mind. But at the end of the day, I am so very proud and so very honored and so very humbled to be someone that they saw inside of their self that made their mother sold on taking a gamble on a new school. But at the end of the day, I'm just happy that that little girl thought she had an opportunity to do something she didn't think of before. So if anything, the bare minimum women should do is articulate, advocate, and morally encourage other women. So Tiffany, I'm gonna say we must empower, we must yeah. bring other women up. It is our literal DNA requirement. You cannot leave another woman behind, especially in this fold. Minority women, you gotta bring those girls with you. And like I said, you leave a door open, you can leave a window crack. However you got in there, you need to make sure everyone's able to get in as well. Right, right. Good point. Good point. Thank you, Miss um, Miss Lily. Um, very quickly, Miss uh, Tara said that she was having technical difficulties, but her answer to the question of how she empowers other women is that she does not hoard her knowledge or her net or her network. She shares them for free. Um, I know that is very much true. I know when I met Tara, um, I was, I believe, looking for some um, some guests for the podcast. Um, in an area that I was not familiar with. I knew that she was. I reached out to her. She connected me. She didn't ask me for anything in return. She didn't ask me what I was going to do for her. She didn't do it. She connected me. We made the connection. And she she does that, not just for me. She does that for anyone she's in association with that um, when it comes to connecting people, she's very good at connecting people. And she doesn't ask for anything in return. So that's the way she empowers people by not hoarding her knowledge and making connections. That is something that Tara does very, very well. Um, she knows a lot of people. She has a lot of connections. She's out in the community. She's active in the community. A lot of people know Tara. Um, and she's willing to share those connections, especially when she knows that you have a cause that you are passionate about. So thank you, Ms. Tara, for sharing that. Ms. Topeka, how do you empower other women? Um, like I said, um, as a businesswoman, um, I saw many lives struggling and um, especially my um, women employees. I used to encourage them that you, because I see their life is into all these addictions and depending financially on either husband or, or boyfriend or somebody either this way or that way, and then uh, problem with taking care of children. And so all these problems, my employees always, when they face, I always used, used to encourage them that you are a woman, you are a mother, you are a mother of a daughter. You need to set example that you are capable of taking care of your kids just by yourself. So you need to be financially independent for that. And I will help you no matter what. So I have um, helped them, supported them way beyond an employer would do. And I try to tell them that I would not fire you. You just stay with me. You will be just be financially independent and you will be an empowered woman. So I try to encourage my employees that way. I also write uh, women-related topics or some posts on my Facebook page. is a Beyond Feminism page. And I always try to come up with, whenever I come across any data uh, about 
why women are behind in particular this or particular that field or something. So I always try to share that those data. I try to share some uh, revolutionary posts that people are still not ready to take it. <laughs> but I try to uh, uh, do whatever I think that this is must to uh, empower other women and to empower uh, or uh, encourage to do this if you are not doing at home. So, so I try to uh, post those kind of uh, contents on social media. And that's how I think. And sometimes like if I'm uh, making something at home, say uh, this is men's work that, okay, I'm assembling my furniture. So I will post that picture that come on girls, what do you do at your home? That is men's work. So what did you do? What I did love you do? It. I love <laughs> that. I post my pictures and then I tell them, okay, come on now share with me that what you do that is you consider that's not your work. Right. So right. this is how I all the way and plus now with my nonprofit, I think that um, I'm really, uh, I'm not bragging. I'm saying that. I really love what I'm doing, uh, working on financial literacy topics, especially now I'm trying to uh, get connected with different groups. Um, if they need to have these workshops on financial literacy, on gender equality, on women empowerment, there are so many issues we can empower other people. And uh, I'm always there for everyone. Thank you so much. I love that men's work. We might have to do like a Facebook challenge or something. Late. I have done let's show that, but let's show that men's work. I love, do it. Like a, I love it. We could do like a hashtag movement through March since it's Women's History Month. Do like hashtag women's work too. Let's right, right. I was going to get to that, but that, that's probably another 30 minutes. So I'm not going to ask that last question I said I was going to ask. <laughs> I have a feeling that'll take us into uh, 930. So um, ladies, thank you so much for um, being on tonight to discuss women in politics. This was a very, very um, informative panel tonight. Very, very educational, especially for me. Again, I'm not the person that um, I feel is a political person, but I'm a community person, um, definitely. I like to see um, what people are doing, how I can help how I can help in the community, um, being an advocate in the community, but I also like to connect with people who are doing things in the community. So if that makes me um, political, then fine. Um, but I'm perfectly fine with being an advocate and um, in the community and just um, helping people go forward. Um, I just think that that's something that I've been commissioned to do. And so I really, really appreciate you ladies who are out there that are doing, making those those changes, who are changing laws, who are putting things in place for, um, for change. I really, truly, truly appreciate that. Um, and I hope that you will be a guest in the future on the Speak Up and Inspire series. There's so much that we talked about tonight that I've written down that I will be following up with you about out um, because we there's a lot of conversations we had tonight that lead to even more conversation that I feel that we need to have. Um, so thank you so much, Ms. Topeka Dave, Ms. Shamaya Haynes, Ms. Lily Nicole, my beautiful sister. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Always, always. <laughs> and thank you, Ms. Tara. I know you were you had to drop off, but thank you, Ms. Tara Long Crumbly, for being on with us, um, being an advocate for for healthcare. And I truly appreciate you, Queens. Have a great night. And I will definitely be talking to you very, very soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody, for watching the Speak Up and Inspire series and supporting our, our, um, our platform here. We talk about a lot of inspirational things. We talk to a lot of phenomenal people, including our guests tonight. So thank you for, for joining, for watching, and supporting the Speak Up and Inspire series. Thank you. Right. Namaste. Namaste.